have been born for me. Thank the Lord that Jesus was willing to come down to this planet and to go through all the things he had to go through for my salvation. He had to leave his comfortable home in heaven. He had to leave his command position as the commander of the angels. He had to step down from his throne because in heaven there's a throne. There's the Father sits on the throne and Christ sits on the throne. They rule the universe. Christ had to step down from that throne and become a slave. He went from a king to a slave. He went through the same trials that we have to go through. He had to be born. He had to come through life through that same birth canal. He had a very unusual birth. He had no earthly father. The angel came to his mother, Mary, and said, you're going to have a son. And you're going to call his name Jesus. You see, he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. And God's going to give him the throne of his father, David. Mary was told the good news that she was going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit because she said, how can these things be, seeing that I don't know a man? Well, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. The power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. What a glorious thing. When we are a part of the kingdom of God, if we endure unto the end, that kingdom will not end. Now, the kingdoms of this world, they will end. Yeah. But Christ's kingdom will never end. Now, we read the text of Scripture in Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, verse 1. And next week, brothers and sisters, we're going to record our whole entire 11 o'clock service. I want to just give the elders and the church notice. Right now we've been recording basically the preaching service, but we're going to do the whole 11 o'clock service starting next week. And uh, we're going to have our, this is, we're, we're going to call this the online church. Because perhaps many of you in the audience or in the, uh, in the world, we have over 5,000 friends on our Facebook page and uh, you know, YouTube combined and we're going to be broadcasting this. We're broadcasting it live right now. It's going to Africa and Asia and Philippines and Russia and England. You know, we've been getting calls from all over the world. And we're going to do our whole service next Sabbath from 11 o'clock to the end of the sermon. So we want you all to keep that in mind. We're going live and we're going to put up signs so that the people in the world, perhaps they would want to support the ministry here. And we're going to give you information on our website as to where to put the funds. And we're going to use the funds to advance the cause of God. Because we, we have a mission, brothers and sisters. Our mission is to take the gospel to the world. And uh, we're going to need your prayers. And we're going to need your support. So we're praying that God will so bless our ministry as we launch our lives online church fully next Sabbath. So we're going to have everything in order. I'm going to email our clerk on by when
Wednesday, what the title of the sermon is, what the text is, so you have a heads up as to what's coming, and we're going to go live. So in Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah 58, verse 1, and we're going to entitle this sermon, The Sins of Israel. The sins of Israel. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we open your word, we pray for understanding. We pray that we would understand what sin is and how sin is not to be found amongst the people of God. We pray, Lord, that we would discover our sins and that you, that you would send us the Holy Spirit and that we would put away our sins. That we might serve you. That we might be in a position to receive the former and the latter rain. That we might be in a position to receive the seal of the living God. Hear our prayer, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. I had a cousin of mine who. He was a custodian of a large church. And it was a, I wouldn't call it a mega church, but it was a big church, very big church. There were perhaps over a thousand or two thousand members of this church. This particular church that they worshiped on the first day of the week. And I had a cousin that's a Seventh-day Adventist. He, he worked at this church as a janitor. And it was a big church, a, what we would call perhaps a mega church. And he was talking to the pastor of that church. And he was talking to the pastor of the church about sin. He was talking about Satan. To the pastor of the church, and the pastor told him, this, this pastor, he preaches every Sunday, but he says there's two things he stays away from. He does not talk about sin, and he does not talk about Satan. Two things he does not mention during his ministry, and he has a big church, he does not talk about sin, and he does not talk about Satan. But he had a big church. That's an amazing thing. To exclude mentioning sin from the pulpit. Uh, that's a sad thing. You see, I know we need to talk about Jesus because Jesus is the Savior from sin. We should talk about the remedy, but we should also deal with sin. See, in Isaiah 58, verse 1, it says, the Bible says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up my voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. So the prophets, the pastors, the leaders, the elders, the deacons, everybody from the pulpit to the pew, they have to understand what sin is and how God is displeased with any sin that's found amongst the people of God. You see, when we define sin, we define sin as the transgression of the law. And we know by the scriptures that we are not to sin. The Bible says, uh, put away your sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the, the, the solution to sin has been solved. All the sins of the past is to be dealt with. And let's turn to uh, 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 1, let's go to the New Testament, 1 John chapter 1, we want to deal with 
the, how sin has been dealt with, how, how we deal with sin in our lives. 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, I'm going to start with verse 8. Here the beloved apostle John says, First John 1 verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the, and the truth is not in us. So if we say we don't have sin, we, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Like if I was so bold, I would say, how many of you have sin in your life? I'm not, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I'm not going to say, how many of you have sin in your life? Raise your hand. I'm not going to say that. How many of you have known sin in your life? Raise your hand. I'm not going to say that. How many of you say that you don't have any sin? I'm not going to say that. Now, there may be people in this church that don't live with sin, that, that are sinless livers. They are sinless individuals. That is a possibility today. You don't have to be committing known sin. As we approach the close of time, we're living in the sealing time, and we know that the holy angels are holding back the winds of strife till God can raise up a group of people who would rather die than sin. You see, sin is not to have dominion over us. Because we're not under the law, we're under grace. God gives us grace to stop sinning. But John is saying, if we say we have no sin, if we are in our own righteousness, boasting that we're sinless, that we're saved, we are deceiving ourselves. Because even though we may get the victory over sin eventually, we have to still consider ourselves a sinner in need of grace. You see, even though we don't have to keep sinning, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So sin is to be dealt with by us confessing our sins. If we confess our sins, if we acknowledge that we've done wrong, and we are truly sorry for our sins, God is faithful and just, if we confess, God is faithful and just to forgive us. Well, I forgive you. And we don't have to go to a priest to confess our sins. We go straight to Jesus, straight to God. We confess our sins to him. If we confess our sins, he, he is faithful and just. He's going to forgive us of our sins. And then he says he's going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's going to take away all your sins. He's going to cleanse you. You're going to be clean. And how many of you want to be clean today? I want to be clean. I want to be free from sin. But I've got to confess my sins. I've got to acknowledge my sins. I've got to put away my sins. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Amen. But if you confess and forsake your sins, you will have mercy. God's going to give you mercy. He's going to extend you grace. He's going to take away your sins. And if you keep putting away your sins, if you get the victory over sins, he's going to blot the sins off the books. You see, every sin we commit is written down in a book. We have angels around us, and they're writing down all of our sins, all of our wrong thoughts, our wrong words, our wrong actions, our neglect of duty, our fears. Sometimes we're afraid to do right because we don't want scorn. We are afraid of reproach, the reproach of being righteous, the reproach of being too good, or so-and-so, you think you're too good to be with us. 
You see, they'll say those things. And we're afraid to do right because we're afraid that people are going to call us a fanatic. We're afraid of reproach. But brothers and sisters, Jesus has promised us victory over sin. And we are to follow his example. He did no sin. Neither was any God found in his mouth. So in this church, brothers and sisters, we're not going to just talk about Jesus and the Savior, but we're going to talk about sin. Amen. We're going to cry aloud. We're going to spare not. We're going to lift up our voice like a trumpet. We're going to show the people of God their sins and their transgressions. So that's our job. That's my job as a pastor. Not only to show people their sin, but to make sure there's no sin in my life. Yeah, I've got to live the truth myself. I can't set a high standard for other people and I'm living in the old way. I've got to live right. I've got to get right. I've got to be right. I've got to walk right and talk right and, and just follow the example of Jesus. He is my example. I've got to follow him. I'm going to be held accountable if I am unfaithful. You see, when the judge of all the earth judges the church, he's going to start with the leaders of the church. Hmm. And when probation closes, he's going to start right up here. And the leaders aren't right, they're going to be slain by that destroying angel. And they're going to work their way all the way down to the last few. Mm -hmm. Judgment is going to come upon men, women, and children, and they're going to begin at the house of God. So we have to be right, and we have to, we have to put a shield of protection around our household. Through the praying mother, the praying father, God will protect and shield the children. But the children have got to make the decision to serve God, to put away their sins. They've got to get right with God themselves. You are held accountable as a young person. You have to do right as children. You know, I grew up in the church. I remember at nine years, at eight and nine going to church and when I was baptized, when I was nine, and I didn't always keep my eyes on Jesus at, at the age of nine. Sometimes I cut up. I had a brother, a twin brother, and then I had a younger brother, two, year, two years younger than me. Sometimes we cut up. My mother would take us to the mall, and we just act, we just act up. Running around acting silly in the store. My mother would deal with us, and I would feel guilty about cutting up so bad because I, I, I professed to be a Christian, but I was bad sometimes. But the Spirit would convict me of my badness. And I'd feel bad that I committed sin, that I just act so foolish as a nine year old, as a 10 year old. I wasn't right with God at all times. But the Spirit would tell me, hey, you're not supposed to act like that. So we're, we're, we're obligated as children. Children, give yourself to the Lord. Read your Bible if you can read. Listen to the Bible if you can't read. But, but honor your mother and father. You're going to be held accountable. We're going we're to all be judged, men, women, and children. So children, listen to the Holy Spirit. I have this thing broken down as the sins of ancient Israel and the sins of modern Israel. The sins of ancient Israel and the sins of modern Israel. Now I have, I have seven sins written, written down for the sins of ancient Israel. Ancient Israel are the folk who lived before Christ. The folk who came out of Egypt and, and uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And those, those folk, uh, they stayed in Egypt for 430 years and then they were delivered by Moses, and they, they stayed in the wilderness for 40 years, and then, then they started their little, uh, their, their church, the Jewish church, the sins of Israel. What are the sins of Israel? Number one, Israel, number one, they, they failed to recognize Jesus as their Messiah. 
That was sin number one. They failed to recognize their deliverer. They were so caught up with the things of time that they didn't perceive the prophecies that dealt with the Messiah. They thought the Messiah would come as a great leader, as a great king. So they didn't recognize this humble carpenter that had no letters behind his name. They would not follow Jesus. They said, we will not have this man reign over us. They made a decision. They were not going to serve Jesus. So they failed to recognize, after three and a half years of loving ministry, they failed to recognize him as the Messiah, and they continued on in their sins. Jesus told them that if you do not believe that I am he, you're going to die in your sins. He's the only sin bearer, and when you reject Jesus, when you reject his truth, you are rejecting salvation because nobody can be saved in sin. You've got to put away your sins. And you need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's job is to convict us of our sins. Okay, sin number two for ancient Israel was indulgence of appetites. They could not control their appetites. They could not control their passions. There was a lot of adultery in the early church, a lot of fornication in the early church. So they couldn't control their appetite. They couldn't control their passion. That was sin number two. Number three, the sin of ancient Israel was their pride. You see, if we're going to serve the Lord, brothers and sisters, we're going to have to humble ourselves. Yeah. Jesus said, if my people who are called by my name, you want me to bless you? you got to put away your sins. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, a proud person will not humble themselves. They would not acknowledge their sins. They're Pharisees and Sadducees. They are modern day Pharisees and Sadducees. But I'm dealing with ancient Israel now. A proud person wants to earn salvation. A proud person feels he's all right. A proud person won't humble themselves. And a proud person is an abomination to God. Amen. Pride is one of the seven abominations. One of the things that God hates is pride. And Israel was full of pride. Sin number four was love of the world. Israel loved the world. They wanted to be like the world. They wanted to be like other nations. The other nations had a king. They wanted a king. Everything the world did, they, they wanted. The world, the religion, they would sacrifice their children. Israel decided, well, we're going to sacrifice our children. We're going to take our children up to a statue and sacrifice them and burn them up in front of everybody, and that's going to appease the wrath of God. Israel started doing what the heathen would do, sacrificing their children to, to, to Moloch. Isn't that a strange thing? How Satan was able to deceive the children of Israel so that they thought they should worship like the heathen worship. So they loved the world. They wanted to be like the world. They wanted to worship the way the world worshiped. They liked the, the worldly sin. Number five, the sins of Israel, they, they feared the Romans. They were under Roman captivity because of their sins. And because of really their apostasy, they became a subject to Babylon. Babylon first. They lost their freedom because of their sins, so Babylon conquered them. And then the Meo Persians, they ruled for a while. Then the Greeks ruled. Then the baton went to the Romans, they ruled, and the Romans were ruling about the time of Christ. The Romans were in rule. Christ died on a Roman cross. The disciples, the, the Jews of Christ's days, they said, we have no king but Caesar. So they were afraid of the Romans. They wanted to make peace with the Romans. They wanted to be pacif they wanted to pacify the Romans. They were afraid of the Romans. That was one of their sins. They were afraid stand out and be different. So number six, the 
Jewish people love the approbation of their peers. They wanted people to think well of them. Christ said, woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. They wanted a good reputation. And they already made a rule that whoever believed in Jesus would be kicked out of the synagogue. You're going to be excommunicated from the church if you believe in Jesus. So fear of the Jews or the approbation of man was the sixth sin of ancient Israel. And sin number seven, which is kind of broad, the Jewish nation, they were lawbreakers. They broke the law. And the Bible says if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. We see the Jews, they broke the Sabbath. You see, in Jeremiah's day, they were buying and selling. On, they, they waited around right before the sun went down. And, and, you know, Jeremiah and Nehemiah, they had to run those folk away from, 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 the, from the gates because they, they were breaking the Sabbath, trying to make money. They used the Sabbath to make money. And the prophets would rise up, the reformers the reform would rise up and, and put a stop to that. You don't, you're not to wait in the temple of God and, and try to sell your goods right before the sun goes down. You know, you've you got to keep the Sabbath holy. They broke the law. They broke all the law. They committed adultery. That they had idols. They were covetous. All the laws they broke. They were lawbreakers. Okay, let's go to modern Israel. The sins of today. Modern Israel. The Seventh Day Adventists are like, what are our sins? Are there a whole lot of sins? But. Uh, Sin number one, we fail to recognize the scriptures, the authority of the scriptures. You see, we, we reject not only the Bible, but we reject the spirit of prophecy. You see, the standard is high. God is trying to prepare people for translation. We need the latter rain. We need the former rain. So we, we need the... Uh, we need the inspiration of the Bible, inspiration of the spirit of prophecy. Sin number two, for modern Israel, we have a problem with appetite also. Now we want to eat the way we want to eat. I'm thankful that they, they make this impossible burger at Burger King. Uh, and some, some folks say, well, they, they got some GMOs in it, so you shouldn't eat that. But uh, some folks are saying, well, you know, the, the impossible burger, that's for the non- Christians, God is trying to get everybody off of meat, so this eating vegetarian food is, is becoming popular. And they're making millions of dollars by causing people to get away from meat. And that's a good thing. Yet many people in Israel, they're still indulging in meat. Now the Bible says we can eat clean meat. Okay, we, should, we shouldn't eat ham and pork. The Bible condemns that. The Bible says we can't eat beef and all that. But in these last days, disease of animals is are so great that it's better to become a vegetarian. You know, our chances of getting the diseases increases ten times when we eat meat. So we have a problem with appetite also. But if we control our appetite, God's going to bless us. You know, I had, to, I had to have a physical a few days ago. I was kind of afraid to take a physical had problems in the past with my high blood pressure, but uh, I had to take a physical because I wanted to see if I could get my, I had to keep my commercial driver's license renewed, I had to keep it up, so I had to take a physical. So I went and took a physical a few days ago, and they checked my, I prayed first, I said, Lord, help me to pass this physical. You know, but before I prayed, the Lord had me, to, I bought some weights, I got a weight set in my backyard, I, I lift weights, I run, I do all types of exercise now because when you when you run an exercise that um, causes your blood pressure to go down because you, you, your blood is circulating and it brings your blood pressure down. You make sure you drink enough water. Make sure you avoid salt. Uh, don't eat a lot of salt. And my blood pressure was high, but when I went to the, take the blood pressure test, they gave me the blood pressure test. My blood pressure was I think 121 over. 83 or something. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a whole lot better than what it was. I think the past 
My blood pressure was 121, I think, over 82. I can't remember the exact number, but it was very, I've never had it that low. So I kept, you know, they checked my eyes. You know, they asked me, was they had a long list? Are you on medication? Are you on this? I said, no, on everything. Hallelujah. On no medication. I'm not taking any drugs. I'm taking any right. pills. The and then they, 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 they checked my age and said, well, you sure you're not on anything? I said, no. They said, are you in any pain? I said, no. The doctor was amazed. He couldn't believe it. How can you be this, age, this, uh, this old and not on medication, not taking any drugs, in such good shape? It checked my reflexes and everything. Everything yeah. came out all right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. They marveled at my physical condition. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Lord. When you obey God, God's going to bless you. You do your part. God's going to do his. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You want to lose weight, exercise. You see, don't eat so much. Ask God to help you. You want to gain weight, do the same thing. Make sure you eat a balanced diet. You see, when we, when, we, when we obey God, God's going to bless us. He's going to lift you up. But if you want to serve the Lord, you have to do three things. If you want to pass the test in these last days, if you want to pass your physical, you're going to have to deny yourself. That's right. That's right. Tell it, Pastor. Yes. There's some things you might want to eat, but the Spirit of God is going to tell you that's going to harm you. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes, Lord. Some things you might want to drink. Mm. Can't drink that. That's right. And you know, you know we should not drink with our meals. You should wait about 30 minutes or so uh, before you drink. After you eat, you shouldn't drink with your meal because when you drink, you're, you're, it messes up your digestive system. It takes your body a whole lot more time to digest that food when you're drinking right after your meal. You should wait at least 30 minutes before or 30 minutes after. That's right. I wait about an hour. That's right, Pastor. That's right. Tell it, tell it. You tell the truth now. Why and you know, uh, the Bible says two meals are better than three. Yeah. You know, you, you live longer if you don't eat so much. Now, if you have a real hard job, you're a construction worker, you know, it's not a sin to eat three meals. But two meals are better than three. And yes, if you put yourself on the two-meal plan yes, and exercise yes. and pray, <laughs> man, the Lord. that weight's going to come off. That's right. See, God's going to gonna help you. He's going to bless you. See, yes. God has given us health reform yes. to bring us closer and closer to him. He's trying to prepare us for heaven. Yes, yes, so again, the Bible says again, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show yes. my people their transgressions. God is trying to save us. He yes. wants us to live long, healthy lives. Yes, yes, Lord. That thy days may be long upon the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Third sin of eight, the modern Israel, pride. We have a proud church today. The church is proud. And we've been around for over 170 years. We have billions of dollars in the bank as a denomination. And, and we feel that we're on our way to heaven. But pride, let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. And we have to view things the way God sees them. I, I, I may think I'm all right. But how does God see me? See, God is the head of the church. All right? Revelation 3, verse 14 says, And the angel, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. Now, this Laodicean church, they were a proud church. These things said the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your work, says Jesus. Now, see, this is Jesus talking to the church. It's a good thing to hear from Jesus, but Jesus is always going to tell us the truth. Somebody asked me the question, uh, Sister Omar asked me the question, do I know anybody that, that tells the truth? The whole truth. I have to think about it. Now, nobody in this church has ever lied to me, so I wasn't thinking that you all tell me lies. <laughs> but I had to think about that question. Is there anybody that always tells the truth? My Lord. I think, I think about that. I still haven't given her an answer. Do I know anybody? I, I, I think most folks here are honest. Hallelujah. I'd like to say everybody. But 
I think everybody's trying to be honest. Say that. But the, the ladies in church, they're faithful. Uh, they say the amen. You know, I know your work, says Jesus. You're not cold or hot. I would were you cold or hot, so that because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Because of your condition, I'm going to reject you. If you stay in that condition, you're going to be rejected. I'm going to erase your name off the book of life. Your sins are going to stay there. And when the judgment comes, you're going to suffer the seven last plagues, as well as the seven trumpets. Now, verse 17 says, because you say you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. See, this is the proud modern Israel. This is what they're saying. Jesus is telling you. Jesus is telling us. We're saying in our heart, we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That's how we feel. That's how we walk around. Of the river. But Jesus is saying, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. We should feel broken. You know, I saw on the news the other day, this lady went to the Philippines, and she, I guess, bought a baby for somebody. So she tried to sneak the baby onto the plane. How many of you saw that on the news? All right. Okay. This lady tried to she put the baby in her little, she tried to just walk through those checkpoints, and she, the baby slid out, and she put the baby back in, tried to walk through the, and other people saw her with that baby. So, you know, it's against the law to take a baby out of the country without proper papers. That's why she was trying to sneak the baby out. Yeah. So they caught the lady, and they, they arrested her. She was just, she cried, and she, she really felt bad. I don't know if she felt bad, why she felt bad, but, but she, she felt bad. She was, she was broken. You know, she broke the law. They said she might spend years in jail for trying to smuggle a baby out of the Philippines. But I'm sure she felt bad. You see, sin, when we're convicted of our sin, brothers and sisters, we should feel bad. We should be broken. God hears the prayers of a broken and contrite heart. We should be convicted of our sins. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, give me the Holy Spirit. See, repentance is a gift of the Holy Spirit. You can't repent without the Holy Spirit. We need a godly sorrow for sin. Because when we sin, brothers and sisters, we have crucified Christ afresh and we put him in an open shame. We make Jesus ashamed of us when we sin. And the Holy Spirit has to be present to convict us of our sins or we're, our hearts will be deceived by the deceitfulness of sins and we'll think our sin is no sin. And see, all sin is bad. And what struck me about this text that says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. I said, man, it's bad enough to have one sin, but Israel had a lot of sins. Show the house of Jacob their sins. One sin is bad enough. Adam and Eve, they just ate from one tree. The, the God said, don't eat. They, they ate anyway. One sin. And they were kicked out of the garden of Eden. Achan had one sin. He stole. He coveted. He stole. And he, he kept this garment and this talent of gold in his tent. And, and Achan had one sin. And because of that one sin that Achan had, his whole family was was stone. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Uzzah decided, I'm just going to touch the ark. He shouldn't have touched the ark. But he, I'm going to touch the ark, but the ark is, is moving. It's about ready to fall. He reached and just touched the ark. Just one sin, boom. And those angels, there's four powerful angels protecting that ark. 
other and with sin in his life, it's very sad. Sin was in his life. He touched the ark, and those one of those angels. Don't touch the ark. No, no, won't touch it. Die right there. See, see, brothers and sisters, we're dealing with some powerful angels. Right now we can't see them, but they're here. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Angels are really over the church. They're over the pastors, over the yes. deacons, over everybody. There's a holy angel standing up here. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. They're watching everything we do. They're watching everything we say. We've got to be careful what we say. To touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. A lot of folk going to be in trouble because yes. they're, they're reaching forth to touch yes. the ark. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. They got sin in their life, but they're trying to straighten everybody else out. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Their holy hands still bearing the ark, brothers. Yes. God is in control of this church. It's like a wheel in the yes. middle of a wheel. It looks yes. like it's confusion. But there's a divine hand under the, under those wings that controlling everything. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I had to leave my house yesterday late, around 7 30 at night. And I thought I could drive all the way from, from 7 30 to 11 30 to get to my hotel, but my, my body just cuts off about 9 30. I thought I could drive, but I just boom. Had to stop off somewhere and went to, went to sleep. Slept for a couple, about three hours, and then drove on to the hotel. Got to the hotel about, about two o'clock. Yes, Had to sleep a couple of hours, get up, pray, come back early morning, prayer service. Uh -huh. My wife said, Man, I can't go through this. He stayed home. I'm going to rest. And I said, I, I can't stop. I got to keep on going. Hallelujah. You see? There's a burden on me. There's a, there's a, I'm a burden for souls. I've got to come no matter what. And I've got to bear my cross. Yes, Lord. You see, if you want to make it to heaven, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to bear your cross. There's a cross we all have to carry. And if we don't carry that cross, we can't be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Israel did not want to see the cross. That's why they rejected Jesus. They wanted an easy time. They wanted a 401k. They wanted retirement. They wanted to be comfortable. They wanted to just live the way the world lives. But you can't live the way the world lives when the Holy Ghost is on you. You got to move. You got to move forward. There's a dying world. There's a sleeping church. You've got to have a burden for soul. You've got to press on. I might be tired, but I got to keep on. My grace is sufficient for you. I've got to keep on keeping on. I've got to come here every single week. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oftentimes, I don't get reimbursed for the things I'm spending. I may get a certain amount, but I may spend a whole lot more, twice as much as what I'm getting. But I got to keep on going anyway because God's going to save those folk who make a covenant with him by sacrifice. Gather my saints together and those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. You've got to sacrifice if you want God's blessing. You've got to give until it hurts. Yes. Give until you can't give anymore. Yes, Lord. There's a burden on me, brothers and sisters. Yes, Lord Jesus. I want to see revival. God wants to see revival. God wants to see reformation. But it's got to start here. It's got to start right here on this pulpit. I love early morning prayer service. I would love to have all night prayer service, but yes. you've got to have it by yourself sometimes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, you've got to get right with God. You see, brothers and sisters, I see the end of the world. We're right on the very verge of the close of time. We are in the ceiling time. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And inspiration says the ceiling time is very short and will soon be over. A lot of people who are now in the remnant church are going to be passed by by that ceiling angel because they don't realize that God has a high standard. Yes, that God wants you and I to be victorious over the world, over the flesh, over the devil. Then we're going to qualify for the seal of God. Yes, Lord. Yes. You can't be lukewarm and be sealed. You can't have one sin, one defect is going to keep you from being sealed. 
The standard has got to be raised up. Because God is not going to lower his standard to save anybody. Jesus lived a perfect life. He lived without sin. And we are to follow his example. You want to make it to heaven, brothers and sisters, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to bear your cross daily. And you've got to follow Jesus. Yes, yes, Deal with the fourth sin of modern Israel, love of the world. We love the world too. Just like ancient Israel. We want to have the same type of music they have at their churches. We want to dress the way they dress, eat the way they eat. You eat. We want to be a poli we want to be politically correct like they are. See, we want to be wrapped up with the uh, governments, when the governments are corrupt, both Democrat and Republican. I saw the Democrats standing up there on CNN talk about climate change. They all had their plans on how they're going to deal with climate change, but it's not climate change we got to worry about. See, the climate is changing because we're, we're continuing in our sins. We, we think homosexuality is okay. Anytime you say something against homosexuals, that's hate speech. But the Bible calls it an abomination. And every pulpit, every preacher should call sin by its right name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Unless you're going to be persecuted, but I, I'd rather suffer the wrath of man than the wrath of God. Yes, yes Lord. I don't want the blood of anybody on my garments. So I'm going to tell the whole truth. If it kills me, if it makes me a pauper, I'm going to still move forward. The work has got to be done. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. But we need a witness. A living testimony. Somebody that's actually living the truth. Living what a Seventh-day Adventist is really all about. What is a Seventh-day Adventist? Well, a Seventh-day Adventist is somebody that has a single eye. All right, all right. See, Jesus said, if your eye be single, it shall be full of light. They have a single eye to the glory of God. All they want to do is glorify God in everything. In their eating, in their drinking, in their dressing, in their preaching, in their testimonies. Everything they want to glorify God. They have a single eye. If your eye is single, your whole body, says Jesus, will be full of light. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Psalms 1 says, whatsoever you do will prosper. See, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is the law of the Lord, and in his law do he meditate day and night. Hallelujah. You want stability? Meditate on the law of God. You're going to be like a tree planted by the river of waters, and whatever you do is going to prosper. Yes, Lord. But the wicked aren't like that. They're like a chaff with the wind driving away. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So we may say, well, this, this, the crowd here is scarce, but sinners won't last long in a church where they're lifting up Jesus and they're calling sin by its right name. I'd rather have a few folk that are willing to hear the truth and follow the truth than a congregation of full of sinners and half-stepping hypocrites. So we shouldn't worry about the crowd. When we lift up the standard, the people that are the true people of God, they are going to come. Yes, Lord. That's what he said. They hear his voice, they come and praise the Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sin number five for the churches, they fear yes. they fear the Romans in the old days. We fear the Americans. You know, the Americans are powerful, powerful nation. But as a nation, brothers and sisters, we have to, we have to do right. We have to keep Sabbath holy. We've got to do all sorts of things that God has told us to do. Fear of the Jews, fear of being disfellowshipped from the church. Sad to say, many of us are lawbreakers. In the church, we break the law. We 
lied, we steal, we cheat, we gossip, we backbite. We break all these sins, striving for the highest place. We're just doing it all. But it's time that we put away sin. It's time that we stand up for right. It's time that we do what God has told us to do. As our heads bow and eyes are closed, I want everybody in this church to consider that Jesus died for them. He died that we might be free. He died that we might live. He does not want anybody in this church to remain in sin. He wants to save you, but you cannot be saved in your sins. You're only saved from your sins, and you've got to confess your sins. I wonder, is there any today who would say, Lord, I confess my sins, and, and I, I want to put all my sins away. I want power to stop sinning. Oh, yes, I've been half-stepping. I have been praying like I should. I'm not having family worship. I'm not having private worship. My children are going to hell. I'm going to hell, too, but, but I, I'm going to stop right now. I want to be saved. Is there one? I see a hand there. Is there another one? You want to go back? Is there any hands up? I, I, I want to serve the Lord. I want to be saved. I want to be right. I want to get right. I want to get right now because we can't wait till Jesus comes in the clouds to try to get right. It, now is the time to put away your sins. Now is the time to serve the Lord. Now is the time to quit playing games. We can't play church anymore. We're being judged. We are in the anti-typical day of atonement. God is going over our lives right now. We're being weighed in the balance. And we don't want to be found wanting. We need a Savior. Jesus died to make us free. He died for our sins. He suffered the death that was ours that we might have life. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Jesus wants to make you right. Oops. He wants to make us right. And then you folks who raise your hand, I'm not going to tell you to come forward even though I would like to. But let's just bow our heads. And if you want to talk to me later, we're going to have baptism next week. If you folk want to be baptized, just come to me at the press at the end of service. Because he, the Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Some of us need to be baptized again. We've got to make a public confession. We're going to have baptism next week. If you want salvation, if you want to get into the kingdom, repent and be baptized. He that believeth in the baptized shall be saved. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we're thankful for your word. Lord, we pray that we would not fear man, but that we would fear God. Help us to preach the whole truth. Help us to understand the sanctity of marriage. Help us to reverence your house. Help us to reverence your name. Help us to keep your Sabbath holy. Help us not to have any idols. Help us not to have adultery in our mind. Help us not to covet. Help us not to steal. Help us not to bear false witness against our neighbor. Help us to tell the truth. Help us to be silent when we should be silent. And help us to speak when we should speak. Make us like Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name.